the positive side is that we had some really heroic people, uh, experts, stand step in literally last minute to um, to give talks so that we don't have gaps in our schedule. And uh, the first of those uh, brave volunteers um, is uh, Brian Sweetek here. He is the uh, author of My Beloved Brontosaurus, among other books, um, and he's going to talk about how dinosaurs swam or whether they did or not. All right, hi everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank first uh, Carrie Lagapuzian, who suggested that I step in yesterday, and Randy and Colleen for allowing me to do so. I feel like an alternate title for this could be Brian creates a talk the night before he gives it. So <laughs> um, and I want to make it clear uh, as I start that this is going to be about dinosaurs, and I realize I should lay out a little bit at the beginning. You know that this is not going to be about ichthyosaurs. It's not going to be about plesiosaurs or mosasaurs from Jurassic World, because those are not. Dinosaurs, and if you want to learn more about what is not a dinosaur, you can visit our collection space. Uh, we have some wonderful examples of not dinosaurs for you to see. But I'm going to be specifically talking about dinosaurs and whether they swam or not. And uh, this is, you know, spoiler alert: the short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> we know that we have swimming dinosaurs today. You might see some in, in a park pond. I figured penguins would be better than ducks in terms of. You know, just visual excitement, but you know, all birds are living dinosaurs. Uh, birds are just a lineage of dinosaurs that showed up in the Jurassic, they thrived with everything else, and then the only form around with us still today. So basically, just answer that immediately, yes, we have swimming semi-aquatic dinosaurs. But what we often talk about when we say the term dinosaur is not an avian dinosaur. So that takes us into the long answer. So when I was a kid, uh, I had tons of dinosaur books. I had to have every single one, and they were filled with illustrations like this. Uh, this is the old sort of early to mid 20th century view of uh, many herbivorous dinosaurs. So you'd often see dinosaurs like Diplodocus or Brach Brachiosaurus basically up to their eyeballs in a lake. Uh, how they found all these lakes that were exactly the right depth for these dinosaurs, I'm not entirely certain. Um, Hadrosaurus, the other one, it's like one of those, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it swims like a duck, uh, even though they're vastly different <laughs> from, from ducks. But this is the standard view of um, you know, swimming dinosaurs. It was always the peaceful herbivorous dinosaurs that were always looking to just get away from the hustle and bustle of Jurassic and Cretaceous life and go wading around. Uh, the reason would be to evade predators. That didn't really work, I guess, in this case, so it's kind of undercutting its own argument. But that was the idea, is that these dinosaurs are basically taking refuge in these spots. And there was a particular trackway that seemed to get into this. Now I feel very nervous in who's sitting in the front row of my audience here talking about this, all trying to do justice to it. Uh, so in early Cretaceous rocks in the Pollux River uh, area of Texas, there was uh, sort of, there was Art, uh, Roland T. Bird, a uh, paleontologist who was working for the American Museum of Natural History, riding around like Steve McQueen on his motorcycle looking for fossil stuff. And uh, he kept hearing about all these tracks in the area. And he started doing this excavation um, once he located where they were. Uh, this particular trackway, I think, is part of what they excavated to go on display at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, but there's another one that I wasn't able to find a great image of, but was like the, the main proof that the long necked sauropod dinosaurs might have spent a lot of time in water, because it only showed the uh, front footprints, or at least it seemed to. So if you look down here, you have this vaguely like bean shaped front foot impression. Uh, and on that particular trackway, you only saw one after another, just these front feet going along, kind of making a turn. And the idea was that you had this dinosaur like Apatosaurus, uh, basically back half floating, its legs off the ground, kind of using its tail as a tiller, just kind of punting itself forward through the water. Um, turn, there's a couple problems with that. Uh, one of them that we've since learned that sauropods from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous, when that trackway is from, switch from rear wheel, wheel drive to front wheel drive, more or less. That most of the weight was held towards the back, towards going towards the front. So basically what happened was we were getting a lower level of track, that these were under tracks, that there should have been rear footprints there, but since the weight was moved forward, you're just getting the front foot impression. So this was not a swimming dinosaur punting along, it's actually just something that happens to the tracks because of the preservation. And there's been studies since then on sauropod dinosaurs, there's a great paper that I think is called Tipsy Punters, basically could these dinosaurs swim or not, were they any good at it? And if you look at the skeleton of this is the uh, apatosaurus that's on display at the Carnegie, you see all these spaces throughout here. 
that's basically areas for uh, air pockets. And if you CT scan the skeleton, you see that those heavy looking bones are full of air spaces. So basically it's like they're almost like, a, despite how heavy they look, that they are like a balloon float basically in the pool, that they're not great at maintaining themselves in the water for swimming. And Donald Henderson uh, has applied some similar models to um, horned dinosaurs and hadrosaurs as well, um, which might tell us something interesting about um, why we find certain bone beds in Alberta and not. So this is just a snapshot of a paper in the hadrosaurs volume that Henderson wrote that I took last night. We're basically at full lung capacity, so these dinosaurs were just taking a full breath and you put them in the water, figure out where their center of mass would be. Uh, you can see that these horned dinosaurs wouldn't be doing so great. This is basically the dead man swim, Cretaceous <laughs> swan style. Uh, it's all just head angle down. Um, and this might explain why in areas of southern Alberta and Montana and rocks that are about 75 million years old, so rocks that are equivalent to uh, Arthur Perlitz formation, more or less, that you get lots and lots of bone beds of horned dinosaurs. In fact, there's a Centrosaurus bone bed that seems to represent hundreds of individuals. It's been interpreted as something like when wildebeest try and cross rivers and uh, cross the Mara River in Africa. Uh, and they're just getting piled up and they're drowning and just getting scattered all over the place. So horned dinosaurs, we can be fairly confident with not exactly the Olympic swimmers. Uh, hadrosaurs, based upon those same models, if the models are accurate, seem, would seem to do a little bit better and that might explain why uh, we don't find those same hadrosaur bone beds uh, in that area of uh, Canada and those Cretaceous rocks. So it seems that uh, they had at least some swimming capability there's no evidence to suggest that they're swimming around like ducks. They're, these are primarily terrestrial animals, but it seems that in terms of just basic physics that they would be able to keep themselves relatively afloat. And that brings us to, to Spinosaurus. So this has been uh, you know, heralded as you know, our first swimming dinosaur, and this is an illustration by David Bonadonna that was in the National Geographic uh, issue that was accompanied by a documentary and all that stuff. And you know, Spinosaurus, for a while, we've known that these animals live at least near the water. There's a couple of lines of evidence that suggest that. For one, uh, Baryonyx, um, an animal that was found in England, um, had fish in its stomach, seemed to be fine in the right sort of environment. Uh, geochemical studies of their teeth seem to suggest a close tie to water. And it was suggested that the proportions of this animal in this skeletal reconstruction would have dictated a semi-aquatic uh, lifestyle. Um, it's certainly a beautiful image, but the problem with it is that this beautiful rainbow of dinosaurs is really a whole bunch of different dinosaurs mashed together. So the Spinosaurus specimen, what we know of it, most of it's the legs and the feet. Uh, there's some, basically the red represents this, the main part of the skeleton that was found uh, that this reconstruction was based off of. And uh, you have some parts of the sail, but all these other parts in the blues and the greens and the yellows, these are from animals that are related to Spinosaurus but are not Spinosaurus or are from fossils from Morocco. We don't know exactly what they are. There's no quarry map that's been published for the original stuff. So whether this reconstruction is accurate or not, we don't know. The one thing that does speak for a more aquatic habit for this animal is that some of its bones seem very dense. Um, there's something called pachyostosis, basically an increase in density of the bone. And we see early whales doing the same thing. That from this transition from land to water, whales bulked up their skeletons, not so much in overall size, but in terms of density as a natural bone ballast. So that might be what's going on here. But the general upshot for most of the non-avian dinosaurs that we traditionally would think of as aquatic is this right now. But we're going to turn to the uh, trace fossil record for our answer. So we can say, Yes, there were swimming non-avian dinosaurs. This is a restoration uh, from an early Cretaceous site in Spain. The study came out a couple of years ago. These are the actual trace fossils, and they might not look like a whole lot. You know, when we think about dinosaur footprints, uh, we think about you know just a really nice, you know, three-toed kind of impression, something that's really crisp and clear. If you came across these, if you're you know walking out somewhere in your Moab and you saw this, say, oh, that's weird, but what is it? Well, these are basically. Um, from where the dinosaur is kicking off. These are claw marks that were left as its foot opened and closed, as it's pushing itself along in relatively shallow water, leaving us this little record behind. And even better, uh, down in St. George, we have the uh, dinosaur discovery site at Johnson Farm, 
where there are lots of, and lots of dinosaur swim tracks. Uh, these were left about 200 million years ago from dinosaurs uh, similar to uh, Coelophysis, and it seems that this was an area, uh, you know, on this ancient lake that they were frequently wading into the water for what purpose, we can't entirely be sure, but the record that they did these things is actually there. Because that's the great thing about trace fossils. I mean, skeletons are beautiful, but trace fossils, that's actual dinosaur behavior. I know I'm not the first person to say this at all, but these are really moments in time that are preserved. So even though you're not getting the entire animal, you're getting what the animal did. And this is a restoration by a coyote um, of what it might have looked like in the area of the dinosaur discovery site, you know, around about 200 million years ago. So we can say yes, that there were swimming non-avian dinosaurs, they just weren't the dinosaurs that we were necessarily thinking of for a long time. Water is often viewed as this rest refuge for herbivores. It turns out it was the carnivorous dinosaurs were swimming more often than not. So that cut scene from Jurassic Park of T-Rex going after, you know, Alan Grant and the kids in the raft, you know, I think there's basis for bringing that back, just further proof that life finds a way. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me. I'm happy to you know, take any questions and come see me downstairs at my table. I'll be selling copies of my books, uh, Prehistoric Predators and My Beloved Brontosaurus. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so this, I think, is based on um, an animal called Centarsis. Um, and the general idea was that they weren't going very deep in. I mean, I guess that was what the interpretation was. You can see the tracks are bleeding down the hill, and that they're just buoyant enough where they're just kind of kicking off, and you're getting that as they, they go across this lake or channel. Did you see that there's an that's right, yeah, and they might have had similar buoyancy problems. I mean, they clearly swam, but that's something to bring up with modeling, because uh, we often, I think so far, uh, in terms of dinosaur performance in the water, some ones that we don't expect to do well, but we know theropods are swimming, um, or at least some of them were, uh, but they still had the, that air sac system like sauropods do, so how did that affect what their buoyancy was, or their center of mass was? I don't know if that's been investigated yet. Uh, but yeah, it seems that the general idea is that they rode relatively high in the water. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much for your time. Oh, oh wait, sorry, you're on it. My name is Laura. So yeah. I found that out, but I didn't know what to do that. I didn't know what to do with 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 that. All right, so the question was with uh, animals like the Spinosaurus, and Spinosaurus in particular, uh, were they more or less fully aquatic? Were they semi-aquatic coming onto land? Were they, like, how much time were they spending in the water? And that's something that uh, I don't think we really know yet, but it seems that all the evidence is pointing to them living around waterways of one sort, especially with that long crocodile-like snout. Their jaws don't have those typical recurved, super serrated teeth that we expect of other large carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, they're more for grabbing something and holding onto it. The sort of, you know, we've got Suchomimus as well, another spinal sort of croc mimic, and that name is pretty apt. Um, you know, really there's no dinosaur that, that's 100% aquatic like a whale is. Like even penguins have to return to shore to, to lay their eggs and, and raise their young. It's just what percentage of their time. And that, I'm not sure we're gonna, we have the resolution to say just yet. You know, it, it seems to be a significant amount of time, but there might be something uh, in further research involving geochemical studies that might allow us to refine that further. So hopefully that's something we'll find out. I got a couple of Right, yeah, so the, so the comment was that um, you know, would Spinosaurus be able to support its own weight on, on land if it was spending a lot of time in water? Um, I think it would, I mean, that's sort of the old argument that we used to use for sauropod dinosaurs, that they were so heavy that they couldn't support their own weight. Well, it turns out for their size, they're actually not very heavy at all. Uh, I think with Spinosaurus, it would have been a similar situation, but how it actually moved, I think that's sort of the question, is whether that new reconstruction, I'll go back a couple slides, um, whether this is accurate or not, whether its legs, uh, whether its real limbs really were that stubby compared to the forelimbs. Uh, if it is this way, if it is effectively a quadrupedal theropod, how is it walking with those claws in the front, especially since there's not a lot of flexibility? So um, really I can say is there's going to be further debate and the issue is far from closed. Yes? So your mention of ducks a few times, 
Yeah. Would you be able to determine if the dinosaur had web feet or What would you look for in the fossil record to support them? Right, so uh, if we want to know if a dinosaur has webbed feet or not. Uh, if you have just the bones, um, I'm, I don't know of a correlate for that, if that would necessarily um, show up. But here's where we would like to turn to the trace fossil record, at least, uh, where if you have footprints, and you have footprints from a theropod dinosaur that had webbed feet, it should show up in that foot impression. John, you were about to say something? I think it's been argued for Spinosaurus that have webbed feet based on rounded Right, yeah, so Spinosaurus, particularly this um, reconstruction, you know, most theropod um, toe claws are relatively blunt. Spinosaurus seems to be one of the most, these really flat things, so it seems to be adapted to walking on mushy ground that you're kind of spreading your weight out. Whether it was webbed or not, like, hopefully we'll get some tracks, because that's best to check on what we would expect from the osteology. All right, that's it, thank you very much.